start recording. Uh, as, I know, as I noted at the beginning of last class, we had covered a lot of material, a grievously large amount, since we were able to persistently be together here in class. And uh, last time I sought to cover um, one or two kind of uh, uh, topics that that um, had been loose ends that I hadn't properly emphasized. And I, I want to do the same today with respect to one important matter um, for, or that's, uh, that really bears on the trade-offs associated with agent-based modeling and, uh, and its comparison with, uh, with aggregate modeling. And it has to do with a set of slides that I presented before. And I think I have them up in a separate, uh, in a separate window, but just to get them here quickly, it's uh, this, this set of slides here. Um, uh, we had gone over uh, a discussion of heterogeneity. Um, I remember vividly uh, delivering this lecture from Boston. Um, and uh, I wanna make sure that some of the, the key messages um, are have some can about capturing heterogeneity within models. So first of all, I'm going to ask you, broadly speaking, we've seen two sort of um, uh, types, broad classes of models that we built. One set that works at an individual level and one set that lives predominantly an, at an aggregate level, uh, a level of the higher up where we're not distinguishing individuals, we're counting the number of individuals with certain characteristics. First of all, what, what style of modeling is most commonly pursued at an aggregate level? Of the, of the two major types that we've examined in detail here, what's the type that's mostly aggregate? Count the number of individuals, Tyler. System dynamics. We have stocks. Any stock. is associated, thank you, with a number, which we typically treat as a real number. So a number that could include fractional components, right? Um, <clears throat> And uh, when we consider the number that the susceptible population, we're simply counting, right? We're not tracking each individual. We can't track. We're counting the number of this same or the same number of the same. And if we run this model for a couple of time, we'll see perhaps some dynamics in the infectious population. And I'm not gonna elaborate what's what the scope of this model is, but maybe we'll see a you know, move towards an equilibrium of some sort. Um, maybe there's exogenous factors that lead it to be um, not quite the you know, damp sinusoid. And a model like this, uh, by virtue of being aggregate, as I said, it's not tracking individuals. So we might say at, um, at this point in time, there's a certain number, if, we, if we're if we plotting infectious individuals, also infective, infectious, infective are synonyms for people who are contagious. Turns out it's also, for this model, the number that are infected. Um, and so maybe, you know, at this time, the model had 500 people uh, infective, and at this time here, maybe we have 400 people affected. Um, some later time. That's the count of people, that, right? Then I'm plotting out. People okay with that? You get what I'm doing? I'm plotting out over time, the number of people here. Now, because it's an aggregate model, and because we don't follow individuals here, mm -hmm, um, we're really not able to adequately answer the question. 
Um, to what degree are these 400 individuals the same ones that were here? In fact, right? They could be the same. To be high overlap between the population, there could be lower, you know, very low overlap. Maybe these folks affected later, or folks that that have never been infected, you know, at this phase and are only now being infected. We we don't really have a, a way of probing that effect. Now, I published them contributed some ways that can allow us cleverly through dynamic programming to infer some characteristics under li limited circumstance but but by and large we don't in general we don't have a way of probing questions like that to what we're the, the same individuals or not we don't have a way of probing you know is it the same small set of individuals getting infected again everyone else not being infected or is it is infection, you know, being spread across the population? For example, are there, you know, a thousand people who have gotten infected ten times once one runs this out for ten years, um, and, but ninety percent of the population has ever been infected, or is it more like everyone's pretty much been infected one or two times? We don't, we don't have a way of asking that. We don't have a way of probing. That. That should make you think, if, if you remember last time, remember I argued that it's not just the average in terms of number of, of, of contacts people have, it's not just the number of contacts they have on average, it's we're often very concerned, specifically concerned about what? About what group? Uh, yes, Nicholas. People that have higher connections. Yeah, a subset of people with really high connections. Those folks are the tail wagging the dog. They're the, they're the folks who are really driving the situation. They may be 5% of the population. In some cases, they may be 2% of the population, but they, they may be the ones who are keeping the blood alive in the population. They may be the, may be the ones that allow it to transmit really quickly early on get going from hub to hub to hub and jumping. Do you remember why an individual is sexually This has been on every single final exam for the last 10 years. Which is going to be. Yeah, the outcome depends, yeah. Um, uh, so if you consider an individual, and let's suppose we're matching pathogen, but it could be conspiracy theories, it could be rumors, it could be innovations. We consider an individual as a large number of connections. Why is that individual, you know, so impactful in the population in terms of contributing to, to the dynamics of infection? Give me two reasons. We went over them last time. I just want to make sure we, they sunk, sunk in. Yes, Tyler. They're more likely to like contract and they're more likely to spread more. You got it. They're more like they're like a magnet for infection. They're more likely to contract it, and if they do contract it, they're more likely to spread it, disseminate it really quickly. And it may be two percent of the population, five percent, that are disproportionately magnetic. And an aggregate model. Well, there are some somewhat cumbersome ways of exploring this, and, it, and I, I'm I'm doing an injustice. There are some really clever ways that we can try to divide the population up by the number of contacts they have. You know, so we have susceptibles with zero to 10 contacts or zero to five contacts per month and susceptibles with five to 10 contacts per month and susceptibles with 10 to 20 per month or 10 to 15 per month and 15 to 25 per month or whatever the categories are. We can divide up the model like that, and we can actually have different parameters C for contact rate for each of those groups, right? We could have the ones with more contacts per month have a higher value of C, right? We have to care what fraction take. If they're they're in that group with you know 20 connections per month or 20 to 25, what fraction of those connections are with other people in that group or one of the other groups? Um, but you can go through heroic efforts to try to sort of capture some of these effects to get a, to get effect and get some real insights. 
solve for equilibrium for it, et cetera, in ways you're not going to do for the state of the art databases. But, but we have challenges capturing, you know, this aspect of, um, you know, who's who's driving it and how many people, uh, you know, to what degree is it the same people again and again or different people? We, we, it's really not a lens we can use to examine that very effectively. It's a little bit like trying to pick up screws with boxing gloves on or something, little screws, you know. You know. It's just not not the right tool. You can go through heroic efforts, and maybe you'll get it. Hence, you know, between your thumb and your and your pinky or something. But uh, you know, it's really um. But when we're dealing with these uh, these types of aggregate models, um, you know, our our questions are often different. What type of modeling or what types of modeling that we've seen either for a prolonged time or for a shorter time are articulated in an individual based model, an individual based level? Can you tell me? Yes, Nicholas. Uh, Nicholas, sorry, Patrick. Okay, good. There is another type. We only saw it for one lecture in the opening days of the class. Any of you remember? Uh, Abby. Screen events in Yes. This is also at an individual basis level. Different scope. Do you remember in an age based model, a lot of the action is about how they influence each other and interact with the environment? In a DES model, how do agents pre predominantly influence each other or, or affect each other? How do they? How do they interact in a certain way? Yes, Clinton. Cues. Cues. They keep each other waiting. Keep each other waiting. That's exactly right. So, so here we often have different scopes, and the issue of interaction isn't as uh, sorry, the issue of, of these different modes of interaction is. Is boiled down to one primary mode, which is keeping each other waiting. But it is individual based, together with ABM. Now, one of the areas, so we have aggregate, which is the predominant application of system dynamics in ABM and DES. That's not, this is not a, Hard and fast rule. That's always the case. We do have aggregate models, for example, of the immune dynamics within a person. How my yeast responds to infection or vaccination or to an anti uh, anti HIV drug, you know, a highly uh, a highly active antiretroviral drug. But um, but we, or we'll, we'll have it for stress levels, or we'll have it for level of tolerance for opioids. And the more opioids I take, the higher tolerance I build up, and the more I need to get the same effect in terms of uh, dampening pain. And, and we can do that, but the predominant mode of, of application of this, certainly, you know, populations has been at, at the aggregate level. Now, in this past, set of slides, which I will now show, uh, or now use to help remind you, we, we contrasted these two. And we noted that in aggregate models, our way of organizing, our way of capturing differences between is by putting people in different stops, putting people in different levels, different departments, different state variables, potatoes, but, uh, potato, pota uh, potato, tomato, tomato. It's just different names for the same thing. Um, and uh, these stocks are used to capture distinctions. When people differ in some meaningful way that we need to distinguish, we put them in different stocks. Why is that? Why, why is it 
that I say, well, we have susceptibles with different numbers of contacts. If we want to, we want to take advantage of that in figuring out they're likely of getting infected. We need to put them in different stocks. What? Why is that? At base. Yes, Mark. It tells the state, uh, which represented by the seed crowd, the seed went to one and no one will go back to the house. That's right. That's right. And so there's going to be different balance of them that have gotten infected or that have stayed susceptible. And we treat each stock here as kind of well mixed, meaning we don't distinguish the people in here by how long they it's been since they entered the state. You know, for example, how long it's been since someone caught the infection. Um, we don't break them down by that um, in traditional system dynamic model. And we uh, treat, you know, everyone in the stock is, is kind of a pool of water in the bathtub. They're, they're just more or less homogenous, more or less interchangeable. So if we want to just capture the station, we do it by putting it in different stops. Hmm? Uh, that's how we distinguish their characteristics, and then they can evolve, as Mark says, you know, independently and have different balance of divisions in terms of the number that are susceptible, exposed, infected, recovered. Maybe those who have lots of connections are now infected compared to those with very few connections are not yet infected. If we want to distinguish people with who wear masks from others, we, we could divide the population by mask weight. Um, low income versus high income, we could divide that. We organize the model um, according to, to the state, the state that they're in. Uh, and we count the number, the, the, the data we're keeping track of here is the number in each of these states, right? Right, each of these, at a given point in time, holds a number. Do you agree? Just want to make sure we're all tracking, right? At any point in time, you freeze time, and you can count the number of are susceptible right now, exposed right now, infected right now, right? Okay. Uh, and we don't really have, in traditional system dynamics, a way of sort of capturing multiple levels like oh we have different cities and you know these people are in one city and others are in another city if we want to distinguish that well we could have susceptible in city a and susceptible in city b and susceptible in city c but they'll just be different stocks at the kind of maybe next to each other somewhere else in the diagram or something like that in the same diagram we don't have way of nesting the diagram okay um Okay, um, and if we want to have like people with more contact patterns mixed with people with fewer, but most of their contacts with people with more, we can have what's called a mixing matrix, um, which is literally a matrix that says, if I'm at a certain level of contact, what fraction of my contacts are with people with different numbers of contacts? And Wade is, is a veteran of that sort of situation. Okay, now with an agent-based modeling, how do we organize the model? What, what are kind of the units? What are the units by which we kind of break, characterize what's going on uh, at any one time in the model? What are the, the kind of fundamental units uh, by which we break up the population? They're what? Agents, they're agents. So in aggregate, we're dividing it up by state, an agent-based model, we're dividing up into agents. How do we keep track of state? How do we keep track of the state of the model? Where's that information stored? In agent. So we divide it up not according to state. We divide it up according to agents, and then each agent keeps track of their state and their other characteristics, right? Mm hmm? Mm -hmm. So each unit maintains, each agent maintains its own state and attributes. <clears throat> but here we can, and we often do, keep track of the nested character of this, that is hierarchical nature of this. Um, you might put agents, for example, in a cluster. 
the duration of the class, right? Uh, and those agents in the class are embedded in the university campus where they're exposed to other influences and they're embedded in a city, which may be, and, and the university campus has certain policies. The, what goes on in the classroom depends on the professor, whether they're wearing a mask and so on, how close they come to the uh, students, et cetera, the, the level of mask wearing in the class. What's going on at the, at the uh, university is set by university rules and, and processes and availability test kits and screening or what have you. And what's going on at the city level is, is, is you know, uh, a matter of, is a matter of uh, city governance and, and uh, city rules as well as the province. So we can have this nested. How would I, how would I carry out that nest? If I wanted... In look, let's take any logic, um, uh, without loss of generality. In any logic, how would I have, uh, how could I capture that nesting in a model? So I have a, a person agent, maybe, and I want that agent to be in a in a say a family or or in a neighborhood. Let's say. Uh, in a school or in a classroom. What, what could I do? Yes, content. Um, with, uh, with classes. Yeah, um, yeah, so I, I think you've gotten the basic idea. I mean, basically, I can create agents uh, of different types. And I can embed a reference to the agents that are in, let's say, a family, so the family members, the family unit, or the unit for the school, which might have its own dynamics, its own policies that it enacts if prevalence reaches a certain level, or the number of reported cases go above a certain level, it undertakes certain policies. That might be an agent, the school. And that school could have within it a population of agents. And it just refers to the agents within it. Hmm? Those of you who have seen object-oriented programming should find this fairly familiar, right? This idea that you have these different objects which represent people and an object which represents a school and there's references from the school to all the people in the school. It should be fairly familiar in terms of a mode of organization. But there's a natural nesting there going on, natural hierarchy going on in the model that mirrors that, that is in some sense parallel from the world. Does that make sense? Okay, this is a point we didn't talk about. But I want to talk about something we discussed um, in here, and I want to make sure it, it also some can. So we had talked about capturing the state of agents when that state that state consists of several different types of concerns so maybe we have an infection state chart at the most basic level um and we noted that there's a certain direct mapping if we have a state state chart like this uh, and an agent-based model, it, it at a certain level, you could be excused for thinking, well, wait a minute. I mean, it's it's more or less exactly what I see here, right? This is a stock and flow model. This is a state chart. The connectivity is the same. It uses different diagrammatic conventions, but isn't this really kind of the same thing? And and you could be excused for thinking that. Of course, the one on the left is kept track of at an individual level. Um, any given agent is in exactly one of these states at a given time. Mm -hmm. They're mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive. Um, but uh, in this right model, we're capturing the number that are in each of these, right? But you could be excused for saying, well, wait, I mean, basically the same, the same way of describing it. But I argue with you on that day. But limited by 
constrained by the strictures of distance. I don't think that I fully communicated it to you. That this doesn't hold as you consider more aspects of heterogeneity. And con let's consider more state charts. What starts to happen, and I think some of this we had in person actually, um, what starts to happen as I add another state chart here? What starts to happen? Anyone remember? Yes, Mark. Mm -hmm. That's right. That, that's right. That's right. And I, I realize there's actually two relevant sets of slides here. And, and I'll share that one I just shared. The one I remember going over with you. So you have different, you have different sets of of distinctions between people to which Mark is is uh is alluding here and we're going to just uh, remind us uh of this um if we have multiple aspects okay now i don't have a, a nice uh, picture of it in this one i i'm getting confused about what's the diagram ah here we go if we have multiple state charts here if we have state charts involving behavior for, in this case, for mule deer, uh, involving disease progression for same mule deer, involving life stages and, and aging for those same mule deer. Those would be different concerns for the same agent, right? Um, or if we had diabetes, tuberculosis, and tobacco use, if those were distinctions, we might have a different state chart for each of them. Um, or for coronary heart disease and retinopathy, diabetes progression and, and nephropathy. So that's kidney, kidney disease or care seeking and infection. You can you can pick your different concerns for a given context, but as we layer these things in, we do so by adding a new state chart. And what was the difference from the situation with aggregate models? When we tried to do this with an aggregate model, um, how how would we add them in? Does anyone remember? We had that one of these aggregate models. Um, how how would we how do we have to add those into an aggregate model? Yes, Mark. So an aggregate model say yes, exactly, exactly. States. Yes. Yeah. That's right. That's exactly right. That that's exactly right. And precisely. And um I could, I mean, what one ends up getting is like if you had um, COVID-19 uh, and influenza, you might be, you might originally think you could get them in parallel, but the problem is you're not keeping track. Is this person susceptible with COVID-19, but they're recovered with infective? The same person. You're, as Mark said, if you really want to capture that you need to link them up and you need to have like COVID going along this axis, flu going along this axis, so that each person you're keeping track, what's their state for COVID and what's their state for influenza. We can do that in a single agent-based model uh, very, very readily, but in an aggregate model, we're forced to create these lattices where one dimension captures you know, one set of concerns, another dimension captures another set of concerns. So for a given, you can reason about the subset of the population that's, say, COVID-19 infective and flu susceptible, or COVID-19 infective and flu infected. It's pretty bad. Um, we, we otherwise don't have a way of keeping track of the size of that population segment. If we put these next to each other and all our interest is in simulating each separately, that's okay. But once we want to have the likelihood of someone being diagnosed for COVID-19 based on their flu status, like they might be misdiagnosed, et cetera, 
this breaks down. We really need to reason about people's characteristics. The number of people on who are in a certain state for COVID and a certain state for flu. Are we comfortable with this idea? Now, the key point here that I want to get across, and I don't think it's emphasis, was that in agent-based models, when you incorporate a new dimension of heterogeneity, you do so by adding a, a what? For what we're talking about here, you add a state chart. You can add a state chart, right? Um, I, I showed some pictures of that with multiple state charts. So I can add in another state chart. So here, um, adding distinctions, new distinctions, um, gives additive growth, additive growth. So if I have four distinctions, say for TB, and three distinctions for tobacco, I add in this new state chart, and now, for this given individual, I have one state chart with four, one state chart with three, and there's sort of three different, there's seven different states between them. Um, not mutually exclusive, right? You're in one for tobacco, one for TB, but, but seven, seven states in total. When we have system dynamics and aggregate, lobby, um, and we add in new distinctions, we want to add in smoking status in addition to three distinctions or three states for tobacco atop the four for tuberculosis. How many do we get? Well, so here adding, and I said distinctions, what I'm just gonna say to simplify the terminology, adding heterogeneity, um, heterogeneity. In other words, have adding these, these two things. So here with um, uh, additions of, of heterogeneity, heterogeneity, instead of being additive, it's what? Multiplicative. So if I have five distinctions initially um, for one thing, and I want to add another another type of heterogeneity, another condition or concern, employment status, care-seeking attitude, vaccine attitude, et cetera. From those five, I could add another five in maybe on my adding state third. Um, um, the B, five states in the first state third, five states in the second. A person can be in any combination of them, but in terms of what you need, in terms of mechanisms in the model to describe those 25 states, you just need those two state charts, each with five. Mm -hmm. But when I do it in an H in a system dynamics model, I need how many? Five, five for the first, five for the second. Okay. Yeah, five times five or 25. If I add in a third distinction, maybe it's employment status. Maybe it's vaccine attitudes. Maybe it's you know um, care seeking attitudes. Maybe it's um, some distinction involving education. Whatever. Another five. Well, I can add another five. Go from five to to ten. Once I add the second one to to fifteen. Once I added the third one. But in an in an aggregate model, this is my Nemex model. How many am I going to have? Under twenty five. So it explodes. It explodes. The amount of information you have to hold. Now we're we're talking about this for for state here, but it turns out a similar issue appears if you want to keep track of, of aspects of heterogeneity that are static about a person. Um, maybe maybe it was what their birth weight was or what their current 
maybe for the model, you're not really concerned with aging because it's of such a short time frame and it's their age category, or maybe it's it's their um the number of contacts that they have per per month, uh, reflecting their, their risk behavior, et cetera. Um we get additive effects by adding this in. I mean, we have an extra parameter in an ABM, but in a in a system dynamics model, you have to stratify by it. You have to divide up. You have to have copies of the states, copies of the stocks to distinguish that. Because that's how we capture people at different levels of contact. We put them in different stocks so that that higher contact rate can apply for that stock, as Mark said earlier. So... System dynamic models, aggregate models handle heterogeneity really badly. We can do okay with one or two, maybe three types, but it starts to explode and it starts to become very cumbersome. These lattices, dealing with these lattices um, gets, uh, gets very awkward, gets very cumbersome. Imagine adding a third one in. So maybe I have flu, COVID-19 and RSV, respiratory syncytial virus. Very common for kids and a big and danger for small babies and for really elderly. If I want to capture that, what do I need? A third dimension, right? That sort of comes out in terms of, I mean, it, it, it kills you. And you lose track of the underlying model structure. The underlying logic of each dimension gets submerged in just this, this you know, hideous expansion of the size of the model. It's terrible, and, and it's boilerplate, right? It's It like obscures the essential features in boilerplate because they're all basically the same, but you can't tell that at a glance. And so you may be casting around, is there any differences between all these where they're really the same? Whereas in agent-based models, you can add in these uh, elements of heterogeneity with, um, you know, in a, in a quite judicious fashion. And if you don't think this is a big problem, it, it is. I mean, for practical models that are empirically based, where you're trying to capture real situations, you could very readily have free real stock that we're trying to keep track of. This for a HPV and cervical cancer model. Um, you might have it representing, you know, hundreds of different stocks, hundreds of different states. Um, you know, it has to be divided 408 times. And we have ways of trying to do that with subscripting, but at the end of the day, that's what's going on behind the scenes. And it's awkward, and it's brutal, and it's ugly, and it inhibits insight. So heterogeneity kills the system dynamics model. Heterogeneity is well tolerated in nature. Are we okay with this? It's not that adding a new distinction in nature based model doesn't Hurt, that it doesn't add to space, that it doesn't add to time. It does, but it adds, and it's not redundant, but it's not added to. You just add it in rather than multiplying by the suspension. Are we all on the same page? It's going to be relevant for today's discussion of space. What hurts with agent-based models? Scaling what? If it's so scaling heterogeneity, adding to heterogeneity really hurts for aggregate models. It blows up with aggregate models. It costs more and more processing time, more and more space to represent the model. But for agent-based models, it's well tolerated. But there's something else that in fact, as you change it. It doesn't cause any increase for an aggregate model in runtime or space, but it definitely hurts for agent-based models, not in a multiplicative way, not in a log linear way, but in a way that that grows the demand really in a in a sizable way. It's what? Yes. Exactly. Yeah. What's that? Thank you for remembering mine. Um, so, um, so that's exactly right. Um, it's population. Why would you say population, ground population, doesn't 
per, it doesn't cause any change in the runtime or the space required by aggregate model. I'm going to say, if I took this population, maybe this is a population of size 100,000. Ah, let's, let's say 300,000 for the South Katuna for our fair city. And suppose I said, I'm going to scale this to 300 million, multiply it by a factor of 1,000. I will tell you, and I will argue and submit that, that this will not change the runtime of this at all. It won't change the space consumed at all. Why is that? Yes, Paolo. It's, since it's not tracking individuals, it's just tracking like calculations. Yeah. Yeah. And so what's the effect going to be? Would I be able to notice at all? What would the effect be, Mark? Oh, it's changed the product of benzene from green temperature. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And and would the numbers in the, each of these these uh stocks change? Yeah, so we'll be running it with bigger numbers, but it's not like it would bring the computer to its knees, right? It's not like adding, you know, uh, a million to a million takes it a million times as long as adding, you know, one and one or something like that. No, that doesn't help the scale. Uh, thank goodness, right? Um, so, so here, really, changing population size doesn't impact the running time of a system dynamics model at all. Do you get that point? Does it change the running time of an, ag an agent-based model? Or for that matter, a discrete event model? You bet it does. <laughs> you bet it does. Most of us here are computer science. And you may be excused for asking, in fact, you may be encouraged to ask um, if in today's world where we have an abundance of parallelization opportunities, opportunities to run things in parallel, couldn't we just run the different agents of our agent-based model on different cores and or in different machines like and and run them in parallel so it, so it doesn't hurt us as much? You know, working with uh, 100,000 compared to 50,000 population or 100, you know, uh, a million compared to 500,000. Couldn't, couldn't we just parallelize that? What's, what's the challenge? Yes, Avi. It was the uh, agent for agent production. That is exactly it. That's exactly it, Avi. Awesome job. That's exactly right. Worthy of a computer scientist. Great job. It's the agent agent interaction that kills you. It's not that it couldn't, in principle, be done, but you'd have to be really, really careful. Like if you had a, a big map of interacting agents, they were interacting locally, et cetera, right, with each other. Um, a distance based network, so on. Um, Etc. Maybe you could find a sort of minimum cut through this where the agents on one side interact minimally with the agents on the other side, and you could you could do much of the computation in parallel with, with only a modest amount of communication across this barrier to communicate what's going on one side to the other side as needed. We start to worry about dependencies, what's depending on what, and communicating that information so you could you know simulate. A bunch of agents on this computer, a bunch on that computer, but not going to be total solid. I mean, if all these agents didn't interact, it would be much much easier. What if all they if they were just evolving independently? Then we can we have embarrassing parallels. I mean, it's just profusion, right? That's the actual technical term. Embarrassing, embarrassing parallel. But generally, you don't have that situation. We have agents that interact. That's why we do agent based models interact with each other and interact with the environment. And decomposing the model to run in different courses is difficult. There is some embarrassing parallels. When we run a model in, 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 in agent-based modeling, what's different from typical system dynamics modeling in terms of 
of sort of running running the model to get results. What do you have to do in agent-based modeling that, that you typically don't have to do in aggregate modeling to get reliable results, reliable insights? What do you have in agent-based models that might question whether after a single run you you're you're going to get a reliable insight? You have what? Yes, Rochelle. Stochastics. You have stochastics. You have, you have randomness over time. And so the results will be variable. And to make sure that you haven't come upon a fluke, run it and, and gotten something just very curious, anomalous, kind of odd thing for that particular run, what do you need to do? Speak on young computer scientists. Yes, uh, Tom. Uh, run it multiple times. Yeah. Run it many times. And each of those runs is what? Yes, they're simulations, good. That's exactly right. They would call them realizations. We say we realize the stochastic process. They're one particular sort of uh, outcome of the stochastic process that results. Um, but they exhibit embarrassing failures. You can run those. If you so if you have 100 runs, you have to do with the model. You put those on different computers. They don't have to be the other. It doesn't have any success. So just different outcomes for random models. Let me ask this. Are all agent based models do they all exhibit randomness? Do they all exhibit the stochastics over time? Good. Good. Yes. Yes. If you have a rate transition, a hazard rate, chance per unit time, some, some probability things will happen. You're flipping dice in the model, then it will happen. Can you give me a model that we looked at and we talked about in this very classroom last time? It was mentioned by someone who's sitting within two meters in every side around where Clinton is saying now, and I can't remember for the life of me who that was. And it may have been Mark. <laughs> um, yeah, Mark. Game of life. That's right. That's right. It was not a fluke. We re ran the simulation and it happened twice in the same area of the classroom. So it was probably you last time. Yes. Anyway, the game of life. The game of life is deterministic. Remember that game of computation universal? You can simulate any computer with that with that game of life. You can set up NAND gates and build logical structures, build arithmetic logical units, and build up parts of a computer and have it run programs. Um, I'm not encouraging you to do that. <laughs> Please don't. For your sanity, don't do it. But if you do do it, try to do it for me. <laughs> I'd love to see it, but but no, don't don't do it. It's 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 not a fruitful human endeavor. Um, it's, it's something that's suitable as a economic experiment, a thought experiment. Um, but nothing more. Um, but game of life has no has no randomness associated with it. Oh, you could argue, well, the, the very initial board conditions. But if you specify the initial board conditions, the rules are completely deterministic, right? Whether or not a cell that's alive survives into the next time depends, does have two or three neighbors around. Whether a cell that's empty in a given time is colonized depends on are there exactly three neighbors. Hmm? Those are the rules in game of life. And a sort of brief, brief reminder of, of some of those rules. And there's no flipping of points in that. There's no chance. It's not really deterministic. So not all agent-based models, not every single last one, are in fact uh, random. And, and if they're not, we just can run them once because if we run them again, we'll get what? Why don't we run it again if it's deterministic? Get the same result. Mm -hmm. So it's no use running it again. I mean, it would be this, exactly the same. Loose ends, ladies and gentlemen.
but importantly since. Testable, quizzable, examinable, the sense. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Okay. Um, so, last time we talked from this very floor about networks. Mm -hmm. We talked about a set of networks. To me, to me, well, a few of the networks we talked about like that. Good. So ring lattice exhibiting from local one-dimensional topology, one-dimensional sort of um, organization. Another one. So small ring world. lattice. Yeah. Small world. Small world. Yeah. Small world is a mix of ring lattice and what? Random. Yeah. Plus on random. Exactly. Also called Erdos random. Also called Bernoulli random. It, it goes by different names in different places, but. Um, uh, but it's the small world is a mixture of the two created by sometimes called the Watts Strogatz network um, after uh, Steve Strogatz and Duncan Watts, who first defined it at Cornell University. Um, other other network types we talked about this is this is meant Desmond space and Judy space, yeah. Um, and when we said what's on Rand, good, and there was a final one of the scale right there. Which exhibits what over over uh, contacts and that it exhibits uh, a something in the distribution of contacts begins with P second word so it has two words first with P second with L sorry it has preferential attachment that drives because of preferential attachment you get the emergence of a power law yeah power law in and the number of, of uh, and the distribution of connections. So if you plot the proportion that have K connections here on a log log graph, this is log of K and log of key of K, you get a, a straight line. Um, okay, I wanna, I wanna ask, network types are, are really valuable for recent topics. Which of those, so, so do we have those podcast networks or, or additional types in our financial rent graphs, for example? Do we have any of those in our system on MX models or aggregate models? Rushil. I guess you would when you have them right though. Okay. When you your big space, something randomly. In the point anyway. Okay. So your answer is brilliant and true. Yeah. And that's impressive that, that you mentioned that because that's coming to the chase. So the answer is we don't specify this for aggregate level. It's it's not it's part of having those boxing gloves. We we can't specify that. Instead, there's an assumption, and there's an assumption of what's called random mixing. And it has to do with this division of the population, this assumption that within a population, ladies and gentlemen, within a, a population segment, I should say, within a within a given population or the given stock within that population, people are well mixed. People are well mixed. We don't we don't have persistent connections. We're not distinguishing individuals. And the idea here is that there's random mixing going on that over time, infectious individuals mix kind of randomly with different people in the population or different people in particular stocks, you can formulate it that way, with equal likelihood. There's no, they're not preferentially attached to one or another. Where does this come out? Where, where does that come out that a given susceptible depends for their chance of getting of getting infected, not on some particular people like in their family, but not, not some particular people like those in the classes that they go to, but instead the general population. Where does that come up? You remember that in an aggregate model? Where does that come out in a formula? What do we call the formula that gives the probability of getting infected per unit time in a in, in 
in a, a model of infectious disease transmission. So what? Yes, Rachel. Force of infection. We, we often call it. Right? Yeah. Um, and do you remember the formula? Yeah. So, so the formula for the force of infection, the chance per unit time of getting infected, it's like an alpha for, for the likelihood that susceptible will go forward. It's the force of infection. You can see it there. What, what was it? It was. I'm, I'm sorry, Rachel. Yes. Yes, yes, exactly. And I'll say C times I over N times beta. I'm just rearranging that, right? Um, but um, I, it's it's to fit a narrative of, of sort of thinking through these. So the idea is that each susceptible has contact with C total people per per unit time, say per day. And then what's this I over N term from? Do you remember the reasoning? Yeah, this was, no, is it the fraction there, family that's impact? Is it the, the fraction of this particular classroom? Is it the fraction of, of the entire population? So the assumption here is they mix with others, anyone, you know, in this case, in the entire population with equal likelihood, right? There's no like, C is just with their family members overwhelmingly. And so we can structure it accordingly, as Mark said, by dividing it up into further departments and have, well, you know, in, so they're a high risk, have a high risk behavior, so they have, you know, 50 to, 60 contacts per uh, in, per week, and they mix overwhelmingly with others. And we look at the the fraction of that group that's infected, and that's that that's a certain fraction of their contacts. But then we can do that to a degree. But in each of these cases, we're basically saying at most this person mixes randomly full this certain stock with equal likelihood or, or the certain strata. From a certain level, from a certain strategy. And, and so here, it's the entire model. They're equally likely to interact with any of individual, those individuals when they as the chance of given contact in the first attack. But this is sort of the nexus of when I say random mixing. So, Rochelle, thank to your prescient comment. Of those types of networks we discussed for, for an aggregate model, which of those is most similar to kind of random mixing? Okay, of those network types, which one is most like just characteristic? I mix randomly with anyone across the population. Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe that was probably obvious to Rashil and put it before. So it's, it's 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 really closest to analog this person ran, but it's not exactly the same. Why do I say that? So so imagine I, I equip my agent this model with a Poisson ran and I run it. And I compare it to an aggregate model. All the same parameters, same populations, same division of the population, and are running up. I'll tell you those people. The population is not super small where you start getting quantity, narrow quantity. You know, um, if, it's, if it's quite large, you'll get very similar results, but it won't be exactly the same. There's something that's different about imposing a Poisson random network in an Asian based model is different from the sort of even more entropic age uh, uh, random mixing and something. Yes, yeah, probably. That is because um, so the networks are going to a certain direction. That the ones that are all Okay, so it's, it's yeah, I think you're in the right area. You're quite warm in that response. Anyone else want to add to that? Yes, for sure. So, Rishi, spot that. I guess it's the number of Okay, yeah, so so very insightful. Um, so 
So first of all, there's there's kind of a like we talk about a contact rate of C, contact rate per unit time, number of contacts I have per unit time. But but then there's also the issue of how many distinct people are contacted. Now in an agent-based model with a Poisson random algorithm, I might have five contacts, but they're the same five contacts for the entire model. And that matters. Why does that matter? Whether it's the same five or totally different ones every day. I don't, why might that matter? Let's suppose I have five contacts in an agent based model, and all those contacts quickly get infected and recover before I happen to get infected. Am I going to get infected going forward? Those are my only contacts, those five people, and they've all been recovered now. Somehow I was sick. Am I going to get infected? No, it's like a fireball, right? It's like a barrier. I can't get infected because they're blocking it. My only contacts are with them. In a random mixing assumption with an aggregate model, am I only having having contact with the same C contacts per per unit time? No, I'm mixing with any. There's anyone out there who's still infected. I have a chance of running into. That's rather different. Like in a in a fixed a static network. What do I mean by static network? I mean like the type that makes your hair that stand up. Yeah, no, uh, yes. The node doesn't change the degree of connection. Mm. Good. Good, good, good. I would like to add a note on something that I feel comfortable So, in that weird model, you have already Yeah. Yeah, and in that model, so you were constantly changing. Network with connections with C people and the people you're, you're, you know, that you're contacting today are totally, you know, have no relationship to the people yesterday. I mean, they're, they're totally, there's no statistical structure to it. You're not having contact with the same people every day. You're not having contact with almost the same people, just a few different. It's like, it's totally random picking of people out of the population. And if you impose that on it, could you could you impose that on an space model that each day you have contact with totally different randomly chosen people, but chosen differently each day? Could you do that? Take some work. It's not one of the built-in uh, built-in ones in any logic, but could you do it? Yeah, in fact, you can even in any logic by saying apply network every day. You just rewire it, right? It would work actually rather elegant. I don't see so, so myself. If you if you want to take your time to experiment with something, do that. Don't don't implement a computer in the game of life. Um so um what do you what do you think, ladies and gentlemen? Um if would that cause a difference if running an agent based model with totally different people every day you're in contact with versus the same people? Yeah, it would make actually make particularly if it's a smaller number of people you've contact with every day, it can make a really big difference if it's the same people or different people. Hmm? Yes. Uh, uh, Eric? Yeah. Um, what if, what if, did you get to Things that we heard that we want to lower the infections, but out of more connections, everyone's going to connect. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. It was brilliant. Yeah, that's exactly right. So you could have connected with everyone, just a certain um, small probability of, of infection per exposure. Yeah, it would be very, very much like, yeah. Okay. Um, so these are some of the ways to differ. Why does space matter? What is space matter? Yes, quite. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if, if we weave this into the discussion, 
of which we just partook. Um, why would mobility matter? Let's think for a moment about contagion, transmission of pathogen, knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, innovation, ideas, um, et cetera. Um, how would mobility play a role? So you're absolutely right, Clinton, that mobility is a really powerful impact, particularly if you're, the notion of contact is one that requires physical co-location. What do I mean by physical co-location? That people have to be the same place. Yeah, yeah. Same, space. same space. So why would mobility matter? Is contact. Yeah, so, so when we go to different spaces, I think this is basically what Clinton was saying. So we go to different spaces, we're exposed to different people. And, and uh, if we are just in one space for a continuous time, many, many weeks on end, maybe this sounds familiar, um, uh, many weeks on end just with the same people, your roommates, your family friends. Or figuring out this new bug that's coming to town. Um, your the ease with which you're going to get infected. It how does it compare compared to if you're circulating widely among different spaces, which is larger, which is a larger risk. If you're circulating really widely, or if you're if you're remaining in one place. Circulated water. Yeah. Why is that? If remaining in one place, could you get infected? Yeah. If what? If, yeah. If the people around you, you're, you're spending more time with these people than you would have otherwise, right? So if one of them's infected, you have a pretty serious chance of getting infected. Um, maybe you're not, even if you don't change the total time. You know, the total person hours you're spending with people over the course of the network is just very few people, same people every day, day in, day out, because it's, it's very few, just the ones you live with versus versus your circulating. It actually really makes a difference. More than that, if you're circulating, you could be bringing infection, and others can be bringing infection to those new venues, right? It's not just that pathogen spreads person to person. It's that pathogen spreads by a new person walking in the doors, right? Bringing infection that wouldn't otherwise be there. Mobility matters. And it, it accelerates things. Just like mobility accelerates spread of information and accelerates spread of pathogens, right? With innovation, with ideas, people bring ideas from one place to another, it seeds, new thinking, etc. And you can get much faster spread, um, particularly compared to you know older times where you didn't have that broad connectivity that we do now with you know the internet and mass media and social media, etc. Um, mobility can actually really change. The tempo of, 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 of contagion of certain sorts. Why else does space matter besides mobility? And by the way, maybe each of those mobility venues, your home, the store you go to, the gym where you work out, the you know, the pack here, the bus, the Palace Real bus terminal, whatever. Um, maybe each of them is. Is fairly well described by like a random mixing. I know in the old days, plus real was pretty randomly mixed. Like, so, you know, it just you know, people passing each other and so on. Um, but um, but it may be that you need you want to take into account these different venues that you go. To. Um, Mark, you have your hand up. Yeah. So 
That's that's right. So so there's no question that in the world space seems to matter. And um and at a mathematical level, there's some you know insights as to why that is, and it and it has to do with this this mixing. Um so you can have venue specific mixing and you know your your communication, your movement between it does accelerate the spread of infection. And capturing it in the model can capture a key driver on dynamics, which is, I think, what you're saying. It's like a major pathway by which it spreads. Moreover, it's one that's modifiable, right? Like lockdown orders or you know, stay at home requests. Um, uh, even people's risk perception based changes to their mobility. Maybe I won't go to that. Maybe I won't go to that party tonight. You know, a bunch of my friends have gotten COVID-19 recently. Um, maybe I'll stay home and watch the movie instead of watching it in, in the theater or whatever. Um, th those things, uh, even if based on risk perception, really impact exposure and risk. We're, we're coming to the end of our time here. Um, I think I, I may touch on a little bit more mobility, but at the beginning of class, I ask you to load up. Some people are still filtering in, but I ask you to load up um, a few models. And I, uh, you know, I think uh, I'd like to request that you go take a look at said models. Um, uh, at least uh, a little bit. And the main one I'd like you to look at is uh, a model on uh, neighborhood mobility and then separately SARS mobility with contact venues. These simulate mobility of individuals between different venues and the second of those, the SARS mobility with contact venues, which uh, uh, they said of Newton, one recognizes the lion by its claw, and that model is, is way small. Um, and you'll see his claw marks on that. Um, he built it up with insight, elegance, uh, with attention to performance, uh, and and clarity as he as is his province. Um, but uh, if you go look at that model, you will see some of these effects of infection spread between venues. And I'd welcome you to try changing some parameters, like how quickly, you know, the degree to which people are moving between them to turn off, uh, I can't remember the parameters of just disabling certain transitions, people's movement patterns, et cetera. And try, try seeing how that ends up as changing the spread of infection. And I'd like to talk about this um, uh, a little bit uh, next time. We'll be going on to a different uh, topic within the HBS modeling sphere, but um, I do want to return to that. And I hope these topics I put on today, going through some of these basics that slip through the cracks, are of value. Okay. Um, once again, a foremost pleasure to be able to interact with you here in person. And I will uh, rest now and hold off. Thank you.